Coming up next, Webster. Good morning. On Tuesday, I shall be interviewing Prime Minister Trudeau. I'm very glad to see in advance that people are finally beginning to be honest and frank about why certain protections are not in the new constitution. First, Indian rights. Even Trudeau says he doesn't know what they want in the way of Indian rights. And it's quite clear now that the province is bucked at completely because they don't want to give a blank check all across the country for so-called Aboriginal rights. And the other one is on women's rights, which is one of the famous notwithstanding clauses. And again, it's coming through loud and clear that while the provinces technically agree with it, their basic objection, except for two, is money, 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 money. But we'll get the Prime Minister's personal reaction to his watered-down package on Tuesday. In the meantime, this morning, I have a ghost of the political history of British Columbia sitting live in the studio, a substantial ghost, who's going to cause trouble for the social credit or the NDP administration, whichever is next in power in British Columbia, on the Columbia Treaty. When the late W.A.C. Bennett, the last time I interviewed, when I spoke to him, he said, the one thing I want to be remembered for is the Columbia River Treaty with the United States. And here is Ralph Lofmark, former social credit cabinet minister, sometimes aficionado, if that's the right word, of NDP policies, determined to tell you this morning that Bennett sold us down the Columbia River. Um, and a word on the budget this morning from report to Steve Wyatt. There's a $60 million Canadian industry, about which I have never been terribly enthusiastic, filmmaking, tax shelters personified. And apparently under the budget, and I'm dropping no tears about it, it's part way down the tube, if not all the way down the tube. For light relief this morning, light relief, light relief, yeah. We've got one of the world's experts in trivia, David Wallachinsky. You know that incredible book that everyone should keep in the toilet for light reading. The People's Almanac, we're up to number three. And some of the predictions in these other books are just absolutely horrifying. I'm glad I won't be here in the year 2020. And then we have, of course, that inimitable master of the Canadian language that indomitable expert in things proper, right, and funny. We Benny Wicks. He's good for a laugh any day of the week. But first to laugh, Mark, Ralph, after the break. The biggest problem facing mankind today, said Webster seriously, is energy. British Columbia has been blessed with energy. When I was around with Premier Bennett, WAC, Davy Fulton, the Federal Minister of Justice, McNaughton, Federal Prime Minister, when the famous Columbia Treaty was signed in 1964. Simply put, and Ralph Law, because I want to get it straight before he goes after the treaty, we made a deal with the Americans by which we would build dams on the Columbia, controlling the flow. The Americans would get downstream benefits. We got 50 million flood compensation and we sold the downstream benefits for $400 million. It's a 60-year treaty. We're, through, we're coming up to the 20-year mark. We now have the right, instead of taking more money for the second half of the treaty, to change it and take power. W.A.C. Bennett swore to me the last time I interviewed him, and he had many aspects of greatness about him, the old boy, that the one thing that he had achieved for this country for which he wished to be remembered was the Columbia River Treaty. And you're here to tell me this morning it's a disaster? No, Jack, 
not the Columbia Treaty, but the sale of the downstream benefits. The treaty related to the building of the dams and the holding back of the water and the sharing of the power between the Americans and British Columbia. And that was a fair transaction. No real complaint about that. Just a minute. How much did, that, how much did the dams cost to build? Uh, the estimate by the BC Energy Board was about $600 million. Mm -hmm. But when the bill came in, it was one billion two. In other words, twice the amount that was estimated. But still, that was a good deal. Eh? Oh, yes. It wasn't seriously off. Uh, what was the bad deal? That was that when we came to uh, decide what we were going to do with our power that we were going to get from back from the Americans, instead of bringing it back to British Columbia and using it here, we sold 30 years of that power to the Americans for $425 million. And that was bad. Bad, bad, bad. In other words, when we made the downstream treaty, we had an option. We could take cash for it, which Bennett took. Yes, or bring it or, back. Or we could bring transmission lines to the border or whatever and feed it back into our grid. That's correct. And it was the first that we did. We sold the 30 years' worth of power, and that was the bad deal. It was the biggest boondoggle in the history of British Columbia. Who was to blame for it? The British Columbia government of the day. It must take the responsibility. And who is specifically to blame for it? Oh, I think that it was the joint responsibility of which I was a part. Oh, you're one of the guilty men. Yes, I am. But you would blame Ben anyway, because Bennett didn't really consult you people in all that detail when it came to the big decisions on the future of the country. Well, Jack, that's all history now, and I don't think there's anything to be did gained you agree, by that. But did you agree with me on I'm that? I'm not going to agree or disagree. That's your opinion, and I'm not going to quarrel no, with it. No, it's not. I asked you a question. I want you to give me an answer. No, I won't answer that. You won't answer that no, question. I won't. All right, now carry on with your case. What should be done now? Now, at this point, the BC Hydro has presented the people of British Columbia with a bill for about $9 billion, which is what it's going to cost to build the Hat Creek Coal pro Project, the Murphy Creek, and the um, Site C on the, on the uh, Mackenzie River, on the Peace. Now, $9 billion will, at today's figures, will produce an amount of power which is about equal to what our downstream benefits are on the American side, which we are, have not got because we sold them for 400 million. Now, what we should do is, first of all, get an accounting of exactly how much power there is down there to which we're entitled. Because as I understand it, at this point, BC Hydro has not got an accounting. We do not have the gauge records of just how much power they're producing down there. And there's a reason for it. Because I think when we see it, it'll be a very, very large figure. Now, the second thing we should do is have, getting an accounting, we should ask for a renegotiation of that treaty. Now, let me get this or I should say, not a renegotiation of the treaty, a renegotiation of the downstream sale. But you're trying to dramatize this and make it comprehensible to lay people like myself on the following basis. We did this deal. We sold the downstream benefits for 30 years for $425 million. Yes. We are now short of power. Very short. BC Hydro says we want $9 billion yes. to bring us up to date. Yes. Are you telling me that the value of the power the Americans are getting, if we don't renegotiate, is equal to $9 billion? In capacity, yes. In other words, I think probably the cost today in respect to replacing that power which we sold is about nine times of what we got for it. And here's a very good way to do it. And that is that if you take that $425 million, add interest to do it, and pay it back to the Americans, it's about a billion dollars. And we would get for a billion dollars worth of outlay what it's now costing us through BC Hydro, nine billion. In other words, nine times as much. But we don't need to pay them a nickel if, the, if we give them the 10-year notice on the halfway mark and say, we now want power instead of money. Well, we wouldn't get that until the 1990s, Jack, but we need the power right now. Are you suggesting, though, that we should now uh, renegotiate the treaty? Not the treaty, the, the renegotiate sale. Renegotiate the downstream benefits. That's to get right. Back to that. And, and give them back, give the Americans back their money right now. And I'll tell you, they won't, they won't accept that, Jack. They would? No, they wouldn't take it. I'll tell you why. Because it'll cost them $9 billion to replace our power. That what? just shows you how bad that transaction was. What you're telling us is that the Yankee traders, 20 years after the treaty, can now rub their hands with glee in the little back rooms, hiding the power gauges, and say, we did Canada and BC for $9 billion. Yes, and I'll tell you, it's worse than that. Because we sold that power for four mills, you remember, four or five mills? Marginal power today, Jack, being sold to the Americans, is fetching us 40 mills. That's 10 times as much. 
well, now, you, you come up with this suggestion that we pay them now. And yeah. then you say, they wouldn't take the money. Of why you suggest it? Oh, I think that we should, because I'll tell you why. Because once we've established that the Americans refuse to take this deal, which we're offering them, they want to stand on their legal rights. All right. Let the, let's establish that. That having established their legal rights, as soon as their legal rights run out, we want our power back. Have we the right in the treaty to wait to the halfway mark on the downstream benefits and say, okay, we want the power? As I understand that sale, we have to give them notice before 19, uh, 1984 uh, for the termination of the sale, which would be about 1994. But that's only giving us about a year and a half. But why wait that long, Jack? Why don't we give back the Americans that money that they want so badly? Because they won't take it. Oh, sure they'll take it. If you we said a minute ago they wouldn't take it. Oh, I think that probably if they see how badly it's going to cost them a little later on, they might. But I think that their first reaction will be that they don't want, they don't want a, uh, the, the money, they want the power. Uh, the Yankees to the south of us, and many of them watch us on the American cable, uh, are already mad at us on cheap lumber imports to exports to the United States, uh, FIRA, Foreign Investment Review, the National Energy Policy of Canadianization, auto industry and auto parts, and a thousand other things, our support of North-South when they want no part of it. And now you want to throw in a $9 billion annoyance to Reagan and the boys. I think so, Jack. There's enough money in it to make it worthwhile. You never make friends with people on money anyway. Yeah. Uh, nobody's picked up your thoughts except the socialists. Oh, I think there's more to it than that. I think that the British Columbia government is going to be faced with a $9 billion investment. And where they're going to raise that money, I don't know. The Americans can't raise it. Ralph Lofmark uh, says here, and he is, I suppose, a highly respected expert in business law and economics. Uh, who is also Minister of Health. What other ministries did you hold? I was Minister of Trade and then Minister of Health. Minister of Trade and then Minister of Health in the old wacky Bennett government. Mm -hmm. More with Lofmark, the Honourable Ralph, etc. after the break. When Ralph Lofmark came in this morning, I thought we were going to be uh, exhuming an old corpse, but it's a pretty lively old corpse, because as he was telling us, he says the Yankees, the Americans, have done us in the eye for $9 billion on the power generated by the downstream benefits on the Columbia River Treaty, which was W.A.C. Bennett's greatest pride and joy. But not only Bennett was the architect of that. Name what you now regard as the other guilty man. Come on. I don't want to use the word guilty man. I can tell you who it's were the... Not, it's not malicious. It's not libelous. It's not slander. It's your opinion of a bad treaty. Now, Dr. Shrum was deeply involved in it. Yes, he was the chairman of the BC Energy Board. Jack Davis was deeply involved he in it. He advocated the sale of the downstream benefits. Paul Martin. He was participating in the sale. Lester Pearson. He participated in the sale. Art Lang. He participated in the sale. So they had a quote, the politically guilty man with short-sightedness who sold the downstream benefits for $425 million and today they're worth $9 billion. That's correct. Who were the goodies in the old battle? There were two of them. The first was General McNaughton. Oh, who, yeah. who said that we would live to regret the day that we sold those downstream benefits. He fought that principle right from the beginning to the end. But the other man, who also stood up and opposed the, s the sale of those downstream benefits, was the then Honorable Davy Fulton. And he not only fought the proposition that do those downstream benefits should not be sold, he went further than that. He put his whole political life on the line. He came back to British Columbia. He campaigned on the proposition that we should not sell those downstream benefits. And he ran against Galadi and was destroyed. That's right. And now today he's being... Uh, reviled on some small matter involving... Forget the small the, matter. You're giving him credit right now. He was the man who stood up in British Columbia and said that we would regret the day that we sold those downstream benefits. If we had listened to him, we would have saved today $9 billion. All right, that $9 billion, I want to get that clear in my mind if this blows up into a controversy and story as it should. Does that $9 billion represent the power achieved by the Americans downstream in the first 30 years? No, the, the $9 billion is what we need now to, to invest to get about 3 million kilowatts worth of power, and it's equivalent to what we've got across the border. In other words, if we brought it up here, 
Now, we would not have to build Hat Creek, we would not have to build Murphy Creek, we would not have to build Site C on the Mackenzie. We might not have to dam the Stikina the Liad. Not in for, within the foreseeable future. Because Bonner is talking again to American audience about the eventual development of nuclear power in British Columbia. Yes, and if you, we put uh, power on the Liard and the Stikina, it'll cost us probably $30 billion, and the figure is so high that it, it's beyond... Uh, the comprehension Sounds of like people. the American missile budget, doesn't I think it? That's about what it is. But, but if we had that power back here, we wouldn't have to do that. All right. How many million kilovolts, kilowatts are they getting now? We don't know. They won't tell us. You mean they're cheating us? No, I'm not saying that. They just haven't given us a report on what our benefits are. Have we asked for the report? I don't think we have. And we should have them. But are the Americans being great traders won't give us the facts on which we can fight them anyway if N they can avoid it. Not until we force them to. Now, how many, how much development in Washington State and Oregon because of this wonderful giveaway, as you, this dreadful giveaway as you describe it? We've got, a, a, there, we can see down in Washington and Oregon a whole series of industries which are based on very cheap power. Bonifil Power, which uses our power, is the cheapest wholesale power in the world. The, uh, the, the commercial rates, for, or I should say residential rates in, in the Bonneville power area is about 1.7 uh, cents per kilowatt hour. Ours is double that. It's about 3.7. And uh, in the United States, the average is probably 4. In New York, it's 10 cents. In other words, Bonneville power is one half the cost of British Columbia power. But what you're suggesting is that if we took this power back, got our share of the downstream benefits back, it would freeze hydro development in Washington State. Oh, it would, no doubt about it. It would force them into nuclear development. And you want that? I'm, that's none of my business. My job is to make sure that the British Columbia people understand how much it's costing us uh, to have, not have our power back here. It's uh, ours, it's our land, it's our water, it's our power. Why shouldn't we have it? Money is just a promise, Jack, and it can be broken any time. Is there a specific clause in the treaty which says that in 19, what's 1984 plus 30, you're the professor of economics, 2014. No, that's a long, long, oh, no. that's 64. too far away. It's 1994. No. 1994, and, we, and you go back 10 years, that'll bring us down to 1984, which is only a year and a half away. In 1994, and you're a highly respected expert in business law, it says here, do we have an absolute right to say, we don't want money, we want the power? Yes. We do? Yes. We can start calling for our power in 19... 84, and it takes them 10 years to put it online, so that's a fair figure. And by then we can say, we want our power back. And the first power will, should start flowing in 1997. And th that would, we could get along with what we've got now, I think, and if we stretched it out, we wouldn't have to do all this d development in the North Country. All right, let's give W.H.C. Bennett some credit. If it hadn't been for W.H.C. Bennett and his two river policy, the Peace and the Columbia, we would have been strangled industrially, surely. There's no question that the building of the MICA and the building of the Peace River Dam were good projects. There's no argument about that at all. Those were well worthwhile. I supported them then, I support them now. What I do not support and which I, what I object to is the sale of those downstream benefits for 30 years. We should have done what the Americans did, Jack. The Bonneville Power, when they got our Canadian power, they sold it down to the California on an intertie. But they only sold it for a short time until they needed it. Then they called it back. Now, why didn't we have in our deal the same kind of an arrangement? We'll sell you the power, that is to Bonneville. Well, we don't need it, but as soon as we need it, we want to bring it back. You're the, Ameri the Americans were smart on that. They did that. We didn't. I'm, I'll be interested to see. We're going to try one segment of phone calls to see if we have any valid public interest in what seems to me to be an exciting development. The, the biggest one in this province, by far. Ralph Lothmark. Oh, still collecting a pension. Yes. Remember when you quit, the social credit tried to do you out your pension? Yes, I had to go to court to get it back. And you got it back? Yes, I did. A couple of thousand a month? No, no, it's $400. 400. Or something. Calls to Lothmark. Nice to know people's personal business. Not mine, but it's after the break. <laughs> A kind word about Ralph Lothmark. 25 years ago, there was an incredible scandal in this province of crib cases severely retarded crib cases, which were not being properly dealt with. Lothmark and I helped nag him, made instant decisions, and we got 
I don't know, 45 or 50 children to move from homes which were being smashed and put in the Esther Devon Institute in Victoria. Yes. That was one of the good things you did, Ralph. Yes. Because you weren't the most popular cabinet minister in the country, were you? You thought you were, but you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead on the Columbia Treaty to Ralph. Yes, um, Mr. Lockmark, I'm a little bit confused here. What exactly are we talking about with downstream benefits? There we go again. I knew this would happen. Well, in 1964, British Columbia agreed to put three dams on the Columbia River on the on British Columbia side. It was Mica, uh, the Arrow Dam, and the Duncan. Now, the advantage of this to the Americans was that instead of all that flood water running over the dams on the American side, it would now be held back on the Canadian side and it would run off uh, in a steady fashion over the year. This was worth a lot of money to the Americans. Because, For power generation. Oh, Grand Coulee Dam was a two million kilowatt dam. But after we had put our dams on the Canadian side, the Grand Coulee jumped to six million and they tell me that the ultimate capacity of the Grand Coulee is 10 million kilowatts. And that's all Canadian water being held back so that it will run at a steady flow over the whole part of the year. And, and you just one other phrase and you'll go on forever. That we got 50 million in flood benefits to help build the dams, right? Plus 425 million dollars for the sale of the for power. For the control of the water going yeah. over to be used for power. And you say that 425 was an absolute dirt cheap giveaway short-sighted, thoughtless, and stupid. Oh, the power was worth billions of dollars, and we gave it away, practically. Downstream benefits, what happens to the water when it goes over the dam? That's what the benefits are for, right? That's right, and we're supposed to get half that power. Did you get it clear? I, I think so, uh, just now, but all the power that we're talking about is being produced in, on, with U.S. facilities. That's right. And we're right. just talking about whether or not, um, uh, what they owe us for controlling the water, more or less. That's right, well, we're supposed to get under the treaty half of that power. And that was what we were supposed to get originally. But we sold our half for 30 years, and it was the sale of that stuff that, uh, that caused all the difficulty. The Americans had undertaken to bring our half of the power back up to Oliver and put it into our lines. And we're not getting it because we sold it for 30 years. And I say we should scrap that sale and bring the power back. Okay, cheap headline, we sold our birthright for a mess of pottage. Okay, thank you. Is that right? That's about it. Yes or no? Yes, I think that's right. You're a good lecturer, but you don't answer yes or no as often as you should. Go yes. ahead, please. Hello. Yes, what I'd like to ask uh, both of you is that if we now deem this as not a satisfactory transaction, can't we be gentlemen and go back and just renegotiate without calling the Americans' uh, names? Well, I don't think that's the way to renegotiate. <laughs> oh, and I think that, first of all, we should know exactly what our power benefits are down there. And I think we can go back to them and say in a very gentle way, let's uh, bring this uh, sale to an end. We'll give you back your money plus interest, and you just uh, send the power up to us. There are lots and lots of contracts that are negotiated, and there's nothing wrong with doing yeah, that. Yeah, I know, but first of all, when you're dealing with a stubborn mule, you first of all got to get its attention by hitting it over the head with a two before. That's Is the that correct? That's the story. So that's why I've been prodding him into heat Yankee morning. Okay? Go ahead, please. Thank you. Mr. Lothmark, you are asking us to do something which I believe is dishonorable. It's true. A mistake was made. <clears throat> it was made on our behalf, and we have the consequences to bear. But you are asking, advocating, that we do something so dishonorable, that is, breaking a promise, oh, that that's the repercussions rubbish. will be far worse than any that would come. That's rubbish. Contracts are being renegotiated every day. There are the, our, our whole business uh, world is full of these, where two people get into a contract, and one of, the, one of the parties says, look, this isn't a very good deal. Let's see if we can't renegotiate well, this. Well, surely it's simpler than that, than that. You're saying that if we give 10 years notice in 1984, for 1994, the contract says we can, we're entitled we can have to do the that. power. We're entitled to do that anyway under the contract, but, but why don't we do that now? Go ahead from Nelson. Good morning, Mr. Lofmark. You're absolutely right. I remember those negotiations very clearly. Uh, uh, it seems to me every party in the legislature was all for those deals. Except Mr. Fulton, who wasn't a party in the, in the legislature. Um, uh, but he stood up. one thing. There has been some talk recently down in the States about the MX missiles in Utah. Uh, they're going to need Kootenai uh, water for cooling. 
Uh, would you care to comment on that? There's approximately 7 million acre feet below Libby which can be diverted by Article 13.1 of the treaty. And that is a considerable uh, natural resource which we would be losing. Oh, the Americans are going to need water and there's only one place they can get it in quantity and that's from British Columbia. It is one of our most valuable resources and it's my thesis that we should defend it in every way that we can. Well, just to throw in another annoyance, do you remember the Parsons plan? Yes. The Americans from California wanted to flood the Rocky Mountain Trench and flood out the whole city of Prince George to feed water down to New Mexico, California, and Colorado, or whatever that. The idea of getting water from British Columbia for the great uh, American desert has not died. We'll hear about that again. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lothmark, I'm very happy to hear that you are protecting A.G.L. McNaughton at the present time. I wish you'd been more vocal before. What? But I was wondering about the downstream benefits and protection of floodplains down there. They yeah. have not ever been uh, paid for properly because at the, at the time of the flood in 48, there was more money spent in repairing down there than there uh, was paid to B.C. I'd like to hear that point now. Oh, yes. We got $50 million or $60 million for flood control. Uh, that was another giveaway. There were probably a quarter of a million acres of uh, land on the lower Columbia which was protected from floods. And at the same time, in order to do our part under the treaty, we had to flood about the same number of acres behind the, the two dams, uh, the Arrow and the Duncan. We lost a quarter of a million acres on, uh, by flooding, and the Americans gained that, and for which we got $50 million. That was another sellout. The only public personage who has backed uh, the Lothmark uh, interpretation so far is Davy Barrett, correct, of the NDP. He's the only one who's ever said anything publicly that I know of. Are you now going to lobby the federal government and the provincial government on this? Well, Jack, I'm just a university professor working out of a broom closet out of the university. Some broom closet. <laughs> hey, many hours a week, six hours a week. You've got lots of time to do this kind of thing. <laughs> no, the BC Hydro's got a staff of 200 engineers. Bonneville Power's got a staff of 600 engineers. I just have a lady out there that helps me with a little typing they once in a while. They can't take political positions. Well, you should be down at the Social Credit Convention today. You're still a member, I presume, of Social Credit. Haven't been for years. Oh, and make a speech from the floor. They'll probably throw you out in your ear. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Where are you? Nobody there, Gladys. Take one last call, and then we'll let... Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Webster, I'm just grateful that you had Mr. Dr. Lothmark on this morning, and I recall the uh, very good work he did about insisting on sewage treatment going into the Fraser River when he was Minister of Health and at least made a beginning on what needed so badly to be done. It makes us think what sharp negotiators we had in <coughs> British Columbia. I'm thinking of this deal along with that of the Skagit, where um, we uh, certainly... Oh, the Skagit is nothing compared to this. But the principle is the same, Jack, and that is that w if we're going to have any flooding on the Skagit, the real bargain should in involve British Columbia getting its share of the power, and we shouldn't take anything else. No cash compensation? No way. Okay, as you leave me this morning, Ralph Rothmark, you're saying that W.A.C. Bennett and associates and the feds so gave away the downstream benefits for, for 425 million they're now worth 9 billion and we've got to get the power back in 1994 or bankrupt ourselves building dams for American benefit or renegotiate right now <coughs> my thanks to Ralph Lofmark next back to the budget uh, with Steve's report on this Canadian film industry kerfuffle I, after the break I'm ex One of the big loopholes for the rich, now closed by McKechn and Trudeau, was a total deduction of money invested in Canadian filmmaking. I think it was a 100% deduction. I never was in it myself. Didn't seem right. Steve's done a story on it. Here goes Steve. We're ready. Camera's ready. Okay. Quiet, please. Roll camera. And action. Last year, filmmaking represented a $60 million industry in BC alone. Hollywood came north because of our geography and our attractive tax benefits. 
Financial backers could write off 100% of their investment in a film given the proper amount of Canadian participation. Starting in January, that will be cut in half. And interest write-offs on promissory notes will be cut out entirely. For Elvira Laut, that spells disaster. She produces short, inexpensive documentaries. That kind of thing does not attract investors anymore. It's going to hurt people like myself. It's going to hurt the people who would be working on the film productions that I would produce and that everyone else would produce. It's going to hurt the labs. It's going to hurt Kodak. You know, it's going to hurt everybody. The repercussions throughout the economy are going to be very considerable. Um, now, the second point is that they've also eliminated the deductibility of interest, which is going to affect me right now. <laughs> it could kill the project that I've been working on for the last year, that I've invested $25,000 worth of time and, def and expenses. Can you foresee the event where films will stop being, being made here? Mm -hmm. I mean, even the big ones, like the you know, $6 well, million dollar projects and the $10 million dollar projects, things like that. Yeah, it's going to make it very difficult. Um, there'll be a few still, and they'll probably be the real established guys. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the industry as a whole will, will be severely damaged. Canadian Peter Snell makes big budget films. He is an executive producer of a six million dollar project being shot now in Vancouver. I think this year there has been a big watershed in the sense that there are only now probably eight or ten producers in Canada who have the experience and are capable of putting a film together in every sense of the word and then making sure that it's marketed properly. The latter being the most important. Uh, I think what's happened in the last four years is that those eight or ten people have come of age, so to speak, and are now capable of doing it. I think the sad thing about losing that full benefit of the capital cost allowance at 100% is that the industry has now developed a group of people who can actually do the job, and then somebody decides that it's no longer uh, so necessary to have 100%, which is a great shame. So I, I presume then uh, it's the fledgling artists that, are, that will lose the most from this? I think at, at the end of the line, it's certainly, yeah. Jay Costain is an investment dealer. He finds the backers willing to gamble on Canadian films. He for foresees a hibernation the in the industry. The government's right in withdrawing support. You know, having given them time to develop that industry, maybe they're right in saying, okay, now do it on your own, or at least partly on your own. But on the other hand, one, one filmmaker has told me today that they created a baby, and now they're committing a kind of infanticide by, by killing it off before it's been allowed to mature. Well, I think I know who it is you're talking about, and uh, yeah, that's true in their case. Um, they had been, much the same as the MERB developers, encouraged to bring along a project, and CFDC had helped, and uh, all sorts of other people, you know, had been, had generated enthusiasm partly because of the tax implications. And then all of a sudden, they woke up on the morning of Friday the 13th, and it had all been cut off. So who's it going to hurt the most in the film industry here? I would say the, uh, the small producer. Uh, I would say that we, all of those people who have decided to stay in Canada and earn their living in the film industry in Canada rather than going to Paris or New York or Hollywood or London, they're going to be hurt because there's not going to be the work for them here now. What about these major productions that come up here from Hollywood to shoot their films here? Will they be discouraged? Yes. Um, they were kind of carpetbagging anyway. Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. So, uh, you know, whether or not we wanted to continue to encourage that type of project anyway uh, is something somewhat questionable. Justice Green works for the Tourism Ministry in their film promotion office. He says the big producers will survive, but not the beginners. Who's directly affected is the uh, first-time producer, the producer that was relying on uh, the small investor, the $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 unit. I don't believe that that investor will exist with this budget. So the, these small films and these short documentaries, uh, $180,000 budgets, are they going to disappear? No, actually quite a few. I mean, the majority of the large pictures were financed that way too. So, uh, you know, uh, there was an opportunity for perhaps a group of uh, talented people, uh, perhaps a cameraman and a, and a producer and a director that were Canadian but had never, and a writer that had never put together a, a large package before. There was an opportunity for them to put together that package, associate with a, uh, perhaps a more experienced producer, and then go to the public in small issues and, and raise the money for their films. Uh, that's eliminated. That's gone. So the chance was there, but it's 
being cut off a bit for now, temporarily. I think it's, uh, I think unless you have a very commercial project and you're associated with a very experienced producer, I think the chances of you putting a package together under this current rulings are uh, virtually nil. Well, Steve, that's a, a good report. I was perhaps a little unkind off the top when I said I didn't really approve of it. But will it put many people out of work? Well, as they say, Jack, we'll put the small producers out of work. Starting January 1st, 1982, what happens is the uh, tax write-off is going to be reduced by half, where it was 100%, now it's 50%. So it's the small-time people who need the, the gamble is bigger. Yeah, did they ever make any good films, though? Well, there have been a few good ones in B.C., uh, maybe not aesthetically speaking, but commercially uh, successful. But there's a reverse side to the coin, too. Uh, somebody said on your program, just now, well, we'll just go to the States, you know, the old symptom of Canadian talent, syndrome of Canadian talent go to the States. But doesn't it work the other way too? When a lot of Americans coming up, giving jobs and taking the tax advantage, will they still come? Oh, certainly, Jack. And there are some filmmakers from the States coming up here now. There's one being shot on Hope right now, as a matter of fact. And they aren't getting the tax write-offs at all, but they come here because of the ah. closest to Hollywood. Is that, that the Kurt Douglas thing? Is it yes, Kurt Douglas? Yes, that's the one. That's the one. Now, he's not getting the tax write-offs on that one. That's all American, but he came here for the uh, geography. So the efficient, thing. healthy American productions using Canadian sites and Canadian labor will survive. That's right. But the experimental ones to develop Canadian talent in, ta in Canada will go down the tube. The fledgling artists, right. Tell me, uh, if you'd taken off your mustache, you might have been offered a part in one of the surviving movies. How do you know I wasn't? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Okay. Next, the master of trivia, Wallachinsky. Is that I've got every one of his books in my downstairs bathroom because they're perfect reading for the bathroom after the break. I make my own water. It's for me. I'm gonna have another update for you. And I heard that. Uh, Come on in, Davy. Uh, I was uh, hooked on People's Almanac Number One. We're now at People's Almanac Number Three. And if you ever think that I have somewhat of a ubiquitous general knowledge, it's because I keep these books on a shelf in a downstairs bathroom. And first of all, I've got David Wallachinsky here who is now one of the three masterminds behind this incredible background information and humorous and interesting trivia. And first of all, before I talk to David, I want to put up on the screen, I haven't got my monitor, predictions on health. Let's see it. That's the wrong one. Um. No, 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 no. I'm going to start again. Let's go back to the beginning and bring that up because I want to ask him the questions in that to see if he knows the answers. David, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, put up the first question. <laughs> Here it comes. We'll have to look up at the monitor. <laughs> They're gonna re -cure it. And I'm just boasting to David how slick we are on this program. Yes, it's very fault. slick. Here it comes now. What do the letters in Mafia stand for? Well, the English equivalent is uh, death to the French is Italy's cry. In what? Let's start it again and do them one at a time. Or is it rolling all the way? Rick, you again. We're going to do this right, it's the last thing we do. All right. All you right. don't mind. It's my no, fault I'm because I was confusing in my instructions to my people over there. And I take full, total, and absolute blame <laughs> for that kind of thing. Let's do the first question again. Roll it. See how shifty I look when I'm looking up at the monitor? <laughs> what do the letters in Mafia stand for? Hold the second one. Death to the French is Italy's cry in Italian. When you lick a postage stamp, how many calories do you consume? Approximately one-tenth. Next one. Roll it. Roll it. <laughs> in what sports do you win going backwards? Tug of war, rowing, and the backstroke. Never thought of that. Next question. Roll it. Two of Nixon's henchmen once worked at Disneyland. Which two? H.R. Haldeman and Ron Ziegler, although it seems like all of them must have. They came from Disneyland, yes. didn't they? Right. And I believe there is one more. No, there isn't one more. Now, let's do, for my interest and your interest, before I interview David Wallachinsky. Is that your real name? Yes, I took back my grandfather's name. His name had been changed by the immigration officials. 
from Wallachinsky to Wallace. To Wallace. So I was born Wallace. So was my father. I was born Wallace and took back his name. You went back to your ethnic pride in That's right. Wallachinsky. That's right. In 1988, the first human being will be cloned. I thought that had already been done. Well, they claim it's been done. There's this one book where they claim there's been a cloning, but uh, they've been unable to prove it. In 1992, the first human will be successfully resuscitated after being frozen and thawed. I thought all those bodies had gone bad right, in they the pulled, cryogenics. They pulled the plug in that one company. Yeah, they ran out of money. <laughs> but uh, are there people now who are frozen to be rethawed in 1992? Definitely. Well, they're, they're frozen. They don't know when they can rethaw them. The idea is to, uh, to thaw them out when there's a cure for whatever their problem was. So they're there indefinitely. Is that a, an authoritative prediction? Well, what we did, these are not, this is from our book, The Book of Predictions. These are not my predictions. We asked 200 experts and authorities in different fields. In your field, what do you think is going to happen? Right, next one. In 2002, every kind of cancer will be curable. Now, that seems possible. Yes, yeah, so of course, a very controversial subject. Uh, some people feel that uh, it'll simply be preventative medicine and finding the causes of cancer that will stop uh, cancer rather than finding a, some sort of cure. Here's the one that's horrifying, but good news, I suppose. In 2030, you'll be able to trade in parts of your body for new model parts. Yes, and uh, there'll be a free market. You'll be uh, bargains. Uh, you'll be able to buy two pancreases for one on Fridays and, you know, uh, replaceable body parts. And Scotchman's brains will be much more expensive because they've hardly been used at all. <laughs> And the average lifespan will be 120 years. Could be. Uh, you also predict in here that anti-aging drugs, that's in your book of predictions. Book of predictions. Anti-aging drugs will be successful and that we may achieve a form of immortality. Well, uh, the, uh, there certainly the big, the big thing that everybody wants is the anti-aging drug and the anti-fat pill. And so many people want these things that perhaps the uh, science will come up with them. You're not making any personal remarks, are you? <laughs> well, there's nothing known. What not was after the Scotch brain remark. Well, you know, <laughs> what, see, you can only be ethnic about yourself. If you're That's ethnic right. about it's anybody else, then it's you racist. get sued under the Human Rights Commission, the Civil Rights, Cana <laughs> Canadians' new chart. And the, so you can, I can only be nasty about Scotchmen. Okay. Although that's not always my in inclination. <laughs> now, what was the genesis of the incredible People's Almanacs? Well, I was raised reading reference books. I used to read encyclopedias for pleasure and uh, almanacs and uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. And as I grew older, I was a little disillusioned. They didn't have uh, the true political background in the different nations of the world. And also they were, let's face it, just boring. And uh, we believe that you should be able to enjoy yourself while you're learning something. So uh, in 1972, I got the idea for the People's Almanac, and we finally completed the first one. It was published in 1975. And uh, since then, we've tried to come up with a new one every three years. All new, nothing repeated, not a revision, completely new. Has this not been in one of your books before? The coming of Piz Pizarro, Pizarro. Uh, that was the Spanish conquest of the Incas. We've got a piece in this one which is fascinating. The coming of Pizarro is seen by the Incas. Right. Well, now, is that legitimate historical research, and who did it? Oh yes, yes. This, this is from contemporaneous accounts. From the uh, these are the Inca accounts, and we also have uh, the Filipino version of the Spanish-American War, oh, yeah. which is completely different than uh, the way we've been. Yeah, taught. like the British. It's interesting to note the British were brainwashed into believing the colonial soldiers and the empire were always perfect. Yes. And the right. Americans still believe that the war against the Philippines was a clean war. In fact, it was a Vietnam. Oh, it was terrible, uh, just terrible. I, I was there, I went to the Philippines and bought a bunch of uh, books on Filipino history from their point of view so we could do this. One I haven't read, maybe you can tell me about. Do you ever appear on trivia programs? Uh, no, I don't, no, no. Well, I, I, I would have to be the quiz master. I can't uh, go on. Oh, no, well, you'd be cheating, really. That's right. Your, somebody searched for Einstein's, Einstein's brain. What is that story? That was an interesting story. Uh, this fellow who was working for a New Jersey magazine was told by his editor that Einstein's brain was still around. Tr go track it down, his editor said. And he finally found it after going all over the country. Uh, m most of Einstein's brain was sitting in two jars in the corner of a, a man's office, a surgeon's office in Wichita, Kansas. 
And there it is, you know, probably the greatest brain of modern times. And he had been put in charge of the, uh, an analyzing Einstein's brain to see if it was different. And uh, they still haven't released the report. 25 years later, they say, well, we're still studying it to see if it was different. Maybe they don't want to jump to conclusions. It'd make a great science fiction or mystery story, wouldn't it? Somebody grabbed it? No, if somebody could communicate with Einstein's brain. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Well, I, I remember the Raul Dahl story where they kept the guy's eye, eye and brain alive. Was that, oh, that was a science fiction? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the darkness of the night, sometimes these things seem possible, don't they? <laughs> uh, are you game for questions? Sure, sure. Questions from fans of People's Almanac Number 3, and he also wrote a dreadful book called, what's it called? The Intimate Sex Lives of Famous People. That's right. Didn't know you were a peak freak. <laughs> and also, the People's Almanac presents a book of predictions, and they are depressing. Well, not all of them. I, I guess questions to you after the break. Okay. What was that famous massacre in the West in 1896? The Johnson County War? Oh, the Johnson County War that they made that movie out of. But the bizarre thing about the Johnson County War is that the, the archives on the Johnson County War are locked up for the next 80 or 100 years. Yeah, I know. I mean, you think uh, it's so old, why would they bother? That was the equivalent of the Hatfields and the McCoys. It was the poor against the privileged, as That's I recall, right. on the Johnson That's County right. War. Because the American West wasn't all that violent, was it, Ray? Uh, no, here and, there, here and there it was violent. I like my favorite uh, massacre in the Old West. It's actually in the People's Almanac number two. Is Palisade, Nevada. The city became very famous for its massacres. And really, what it was was the town. They didn't want people to stop there, and the train went through. Every time the train stopped, they would stage a huge fight, and the people it got an enormous reputation that this was a place you couldn't get off the train. Really, not a single person got killed there. They it just was, it was all act. theater. It was all theater. Name of the place? Palisade, Nevada. Palisade, Nevada. Of your favorite murder? Pardon me? Of your favorite, I'm sorry about my accent, <laughs> murder. Ah, ah, well, it's hard to come up with a favorite murder. I think the like. Kennedy one has still got to be. Was well, Madeleine Monroe murdered? Well, if I were to put money on it, I would say that she was murdered. But the problem is that so many years have gone by that the physical evidence is gone. You could never prove it physically. You have a prediction in one of your books, one of the recent books, in which Billy Graham is going to be involved in a psychic prediction. Do you know it? <laughs> well, the, the thing is the, uh, that he would uh, solve, the, uh, solve Marilyn Monroe's murder. But we also have, we have a, a statistical analysis of psychic predictions uh, from the National Enquirer in which we discovered that 98.9% .9 of their predictions were wrong. 98.9% yes. of the predictions. Yes. But there were some good ones. Joanna South? Joanna Southcutt. John at Southcott? Yes, and we, ha we, have all we also have, in our book, we have uh, a big section of scientific predictions and, and sort of realistic predictions. Then we have the history of predictions, in which we have the best and worst predictions. <coughs> the New York Times, a week before, uh, well, the New York Times uh, chastised all scientists who were studying air travel. And then one week later, the Wright brothers had their flight at Kitty Hawk. So uh, even the uh, New York Times doesn't do They didn't well. invent the airplane. No. No. Well, there was a great competition. Samuel Langley, uh, n he had just made this attempt to fly, and uh, it didn't work, and then he lost out, and the Wright brothers got there first. If the Wright brothers had caught a cold, he might have been first in the air. Could have been. Go ahead to David Wallachinsky. That's right. Hello. Where are you? Nobody there. Take it again. Hello? That's you. Go ahead, sir. Uh, look, my name is Mr. Zeberman. I'm calling in this morning to find out if this gentleman has heard anything about the work that's been done by Manitoba doctors in the reviving of individuals who've been frozen to death. I've heard a number of cases who've been frozen totally. No, 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 no. A, number, a woman uh, in 1979 no, was different. found outside of Portage. Okay, hold on. Then I'll make my smart crack eight later. Well, that, that's a completely different subject. The fact is that uh, I think there's been two people who've survived 57 degrees Fahrenheit being frozen and have been brought back to life with damage but still alive. But this is different. Cryonic freezing that we were talking about brings them down to zero. And they, they thaw them out 
theoretically when, when a cure has been found down the line. A local joke I've got to make, there has been a, a, a demonstration of cryogenics in Manitoba just recently. Sterling Lyon, the Tory leader, has been frozen <laughs> and Pauly, the NDP leader, has apparently been brought back to life. <laughs> Local joke. I read yesterday. <laughs> Go ahead, please, from Nanny Mo. Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask the gentleman one question. Say, like, when I came to Canada, say, about eight years ago, I heard the black hole of Calcutta. And in India, they say that it was the British who put Indians in that black hole. But when I came to Canada, I heard it was the Indian. Who put the British? Uh, who put... Uh, now, okay, this is a general knowledge question for which David has the answer. Well, actually, that, that is one of those that falls under the other side of history. Uh, having just been to India a couple months ago, uh, the, the black hole of Calcutta did happen. This, this uh, uh, Indian leader did squash, you know, 100 people into a small space. But it was only after a long train of abuses that the, the British had uh, inflicted upon the Indians. And, of course, the one thing that the British remember is the black hole of Calcutta. Uh -huh. Yeah, pork fat on the bullets. They, that's right. Pork, pork fat, fat on the bullets. The Sepoy mutiny. Supposedly, and yeah. that caused the Indian, the sepoy. The sepoy mutiny. Yeah. Sepoy mutiny. Do you travel the world all the time? Only when I get a chance. I love to travel. Go ahead, please. Hi. I was just uh, wondering if the gentleman has uh, any predictions as to whether perhaps the United States or North America is going to go into a closed door policy to the rest of the world and say, well, you can't destroy us. So we don't need you, so we're just going to do the best we can with what we got. So go have all your wars and your religious fights and everything else you want. We don't really need Okay, them. predictions. You have a variety of predictions in the little book. Okay, well, I can, t I can tell you uh, my prediction on that, although I think it would be benefit uh, both Canada and the United States to become self-sufficient in energy and national re natural resources. In fact, uh, the uh, big corporations and multinational corporations are dependent on cheap labor and cheap resources for the rest of the world. And that's why we're not going to become uh, isolationist. Mm -hmm. Have you any predictions about Reagan? Uh, yes, I think we all have to uh, concentrate on him so that he doesn't get us into a war. I think he really wants to get us into a war. He's just looking for the right one. There are nuclear predictions, there are nuclear war predictions, there are non-nuclear war predictions in the book. You can read the book and take your choice. Right, right. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, what, uh, I would be interested to know what is your ethnic origin, Mr. Wallachinsky? Uh, I'm American. Jewish. And Jewish American. Jewish, Jewish American. My family came from that part of the world, which was sometimes Poland, sometimes Russia. And, That's when why he, Wallachinsky. and when your people got off at Ellis Island, the immigration guy, being a wasp, said, ah, let's make it easy. We'll give him a name that can be understood, perhaps with goodwill. Well, that's right. As a matter of fact, what happened was uh, they, they said, what's your name, Wallachinsky? They said, no, from now on, your name is Wallace. And the final thing that made me change my name was I was uh, going through customs in uh, England, and they said, what's your name? And I said, Wallace. And they said, ah, a good Scottish boy returning home. <laughs> <laughs> How many people put this out? Uh, how many people put it out? Research well, staff. There, we have a full-time staff of 12, and we use 60 freelance writers. How many copies sold of all your Wallachinsky books? All of them, there's been uh, between 5 and 6 million. Particularly, the Book of List is sold uh, over Only in English? Million. No, uh, I just went on a publicity tour in Japan, and uh, the Book of List has been in many languages, Portuguese. Uh, put your name in that, so when I pick it up in the morning, I, I okay. get I'll remember okay. that I met you. Ben Wicks next. We Benny Wicks. After the break. <laughs> Who was the famous woman that wrote about etiquette? The famous Amy Vanderbilt. Not Amy Van Roo. There's yeah, another she was one. The most Emily Post. Emily Post is one. I learned my manners from Emily Post. Well, that's why you should have listened to Amy Vanderbilt. And my <laughs> manners are impeccable. I have here, however, a distinguished lecturer in manners. Uh, and I make no apologies for this somewhat incestuous return of we Benny Wicks. <laughs> and Benny, I first of all want you to drill me, in yeah. case any one of my British family ever gets a knighthood, right. on how to approach the Queen. I think this is a 
this, this is brought about, and I make a large issue of this in the book, because many, many people in England are bothered about the fact that the likes of you are now getting money and credit cards, and are able to get to London, invade London, and are being, uh, being seen in the presence of the Queen. Now, the latest story I heard, believe it or not, was you know there's a Safeways just behind the palace. <laughs> now, the Queen is in there every morning, as you know, Jack, and Canadians have been known, they see her going through the express lineup, see? And they're now going up to her and saying, you got more than bleeding eight items, see? Of course she's got more than eight items. She got 75,000 in the palace to feed. Did you know that? <laughs> this is why. And other things, they're, they're, not, they're not accustomed to going to the theatre. See, now, to be really posh and up there, you've got to go theatre. Cinema, movies is out. The more boring the show, the, the better you are. Because you're not going to see it, you're going to be seen. See? When you get there, if it's a really boring show, you'll find the Queen is here. She always gets here, maybe an hour late, maybe two hours late. Now, nothing can happen until she gets here, see, which is tough. Now, Canadians have been known recently, they watch in that little box, see, she comes in, and now they're standing up and saying, and about bloody time too. <laughs> <laughs> so the marvellous thing, while we're on the subject of theatre, was a marvellous story I heard, and it's a true story Richard Dawson told. He said when he performed at the, at the Palladium for a Royal Command performance, the Queen was there, see, and he said at the end of the show, they lined up behind the curtain. Now understand, this is true. Lined up behind the curtain, and a little guy came out to give him some lessons on the Queen, see, etiquette. So you can learn from this. This little guy said, don't speak first, right, and don't get involved in a conversation, and it's just yes or no to Her Majesty, right? Now the little guy goes, and he lines up between Gregory Peck and Ingrid Bergman, or whatever, very famous people, see. Now she comes here, right, he sees out the corner of his eye, the Queen starts down the line with this little guy, and he's whispering in her ear, see, that's Robert Redford, because she never goes to movies, see? She wouldn't know who the hell it is. So she's shaking hands, right? He says she got in front of him, claims this is absolutely true, he bowed his head, put his hand out, and she took his hand and she said, wonderful to meet you, Howard Keel. <laughs> see, now Howard Keel's about six foot eight, see? <laughs> so he figured, I better not get involved in a conversation, right? It got worse. She then said, I loved you in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> now he figures I've got to speak. So he says, your majesty, I'm afraid you've made a mistake. My name is Richard Dawson. To which she replied, oh, you're much too modest. And moved on. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've since heard he's changed his name to Howard Kill. So because he was wrong all the, the first time. The first tip is, if you bump into the Queen in the supermarket, don't nag at her because she's got more than eight items in the basket in the right. express line. Right. And uh, have you met the Queen? No, you wouldn't. Uh, only when she was princess. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. Very you very haven't good. been to a garden party, you? No. How does one behave at a garden party at the palace? Garden party is very interesting. It's no big deal. I mean, I've been three times now. But when you get there, there's 5,000 others. That's in case the viewers are thinking of holding a garden party. You need a bloody big garden <laughs> for a start off. Right? There are 5,000 and you're shoulder to shoulder. All with high hats, see? Not the women. They got wide hats. Now, they don't realise, but you know the balcony that she makes these announcements for, birth or wedding or whatever. She comes out on there on all fours, right? And she looks through the banisters, right? And she sees who she knows down there, right? She don't want a boring conversation with a bloody stranger. She now made her way the third time through the crowd, see? And she came right up to me, see? Now, you know I love her dearly. I mean, I'm a bloody great royalist. But I'll tell you the truth. She goes on and on and on. And it's all bloody horses and dogs. So I said to her, I said, look, your majesty, I said, you stay right here, and I'm going to freshen up my drink, I think. <laughs> but when I got to the bar, she'd run round the palace. She was enjoying the conversation. She was at the bar when I got there. <laughs> it's incredible. Look, uh, you have some to topical etiquette advice on how to approach your father-in-law or uh, your bride, but I understand that you tackle a social si situation which is prevalent on the streets of Vancouver. Yes, uh, how to approach a prostitute. Now, when, <laughs> I should explain that I once interviewed Amy Vanderbilt in New York, and uh, she committed suicide two weeks after. Now, I thought it was a better interview than that, but nevertheless, <laughs> she did it. She gave me her big, thick book. Now, I was astonished when I went through this book that there was not a chapter on how to approach a prostitute. See? Uh, the thing you should remember if you're doing it for the first time, you shouldn't be nervous, see. For one thing, she's not going to bite you, unless that's what you want. <laughs> I don't understand that costs extra. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it on your own street. 
A lot of guys go on it. One guy I know, it was a dark night, he approached his wife going to Beckers <laughs> for a bottle of milk. <laughs> Very, so you go out of town. Now, if you're still embarrassed on the street, you have to go to a brothel. So I've got five brothels in there in the Varda. Now, you've got to be bloody desperate if you want to get to the Varda <laughs> to enjoy yourself. But I put them in there along with phone numbers. I, you have done that. I've done that. Yeah, there's some very good stories here about one prostitute was acquitted uh, having approached a police officer three times because the police officer didn't say no <laughs> loudly <laughs> enough. That's, That's a true story. I read that. I was astonished. All right, what other etiquette shall we deal with this morning? Well, I think the Pope... Meeting the Pope. Meeting the Pope is very important. A lot of people want to meet the Pope, see? They, now, he also has a balcony. You know that. But he has about five million, and he's always on it. He's out on that balcony every minute of the day. It's because they have different weather to what they have in London. <laughs> the Queen would be out there more if it wasn't bloody raining, see? Now, he comes out and he sort of waves his arms at everyone. Right? You don't have to worry about what he's saying. If he speaks 87 languages, so you wouldn't understand it anyway. And the time he gets to your language, you might as well go home. But a lot of people are excited because they're getting a private audience, see? Now, they figure, I'm going to save up my worst sin and I'll tell him in private. <laughs> But they should know, there's 85 people in the room with you, <laughs> all for a private audience. So you should be prepared for that. Oh, good. Sport. Um, sport. sport. Look at sport. Sport is very important because I want to draw. This is very important. You want important. to draw? Okay. Yeah. Over here, it, it bothers me, they play ice hockey Ch and stuff that, like yeah. that. Can well, I do it to this one? Any way you like. This yeah. one or what? That one always Okay. Good. Now, they, want to pl they, they play ice hockey. I'll tell you what, like let's that. do this. We'll just chop you for a moment. And we'll go to the break, come to the phones, and you can start with your sport. All right, yeah. Oh, as long as it's not too long, because I'm very busy. From your book called <laughs> Etiquette. Yeah, very good. I like that. After the break. I'd like to speak to Webster. Going to take call to Ben. Ben. Well, ben, what about we're... this? What about this sport? Don't matter like the bloody calls. There are people playing ice hockey here. There's well, no cricket. You, you know, no polo. I'll get bloody hell later on for your language this morning. Oh, so I'm sorry. You know, it's just been abominable. I know. And surely the first thing of etiquette is not to use these crude words. No, once you're up there, they don't care. They don't when you're care. at the top. Now, if you used them, of course, they'd be bothered. <laughs> sport. OK. You're going to draw for sport. Ice hockey. OK, ice big hockey. Game here, right? Big game. Bothers me because everyone playing it loses their front teeth, right? What they should play is polo. you got your own teeth? Yeah, of course I've got my own okay. teeth. National health. <laughs> National health, yeah. Right. With polo, see, it's the horse that loses its front teeth. <laughs> That's the wonderful thing. Now, most people are bothered when they start polo. I, yeah, I'll draw it like this. Because they're not sure how to buy a good horse, see? Now, here, here, here is a bad horse, right? That's a bad horse. If you see it with one like that, the other one, the one you want, is one that looks like this, see? It's got four of them hanging on the bottom. So don't buy one of these, especially if it's leaning up against a wall. <laughs> so that's very useful information, I think. I want more drawings. Oh, you want more drawings? Yeah, I want more drawings. Yeah, it's only so that you can buy them after the programme and oh, sell them for double the price. Do you sell your cartoons? I sell the cartoons. I just had an exhibition in Eaton's. In Eaton's, have you? Yeah, in, in Toronto, where it's important. How about meeting the media? Meeting the media, the fact is you should understand that you are important. You're the one that they want to talk to. How about gentlemen? Gentlemen, well, here it is. Gentlemen don't, don't talk, work. They, How about your Gentlemen don't work. That's right. And they don't live in the city. They live in the country. What about that dreadful business which you were campaigning for the last time for uh, selective breeding of the English upper class with the Canadian workers? I was disappointed in that because the six aristocrats who promised to come over and interbreed with the selected Canadian <laughs> females changed their mind at the end. It seems someone had shown them a picture of Vancouver. They said in no way we bleed and go in there. Right? It was worse when they showed them the girls that lived in Vancouver. And of course, the thing what people don't understand is that we, the English, do not enjoy sex. We do it because the girls like it. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it at all. Do you have any sex tips in this book? Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't like to discuss the sex tips because, uh, as I say, they're a bit touchy and people might get upset. Uh, but there are very important sex tips. Do you know the uh, social kissing started when knights of old, you know, in days of bold, when the knights got damsels in distress or someone. They used to come along a country road 
and they'd lift up each other's visor, see, to make sure there was no hidden weapon. And then they came in close, both looking in the visor. Before they know where they were, they were kissing each other. <laughs> That's why you get all these men kissing each other at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should leave the sex. There's one very good one, though, on finding your partner in bed with another man. Yeah, well, that's true. It depends on what the other man looks like. I mean, if you're a girl there, <laughs> and you can get in by the side of him if you really like the look of him, you know. And if you push hard enough, you can get rid of the other one on the other side. You actually uh, advocate uh, physical violence in certain circumstances. Yeah, physical violence, you, you should. And that's if, if your wife is in bed with another man. You get to this door and you hear giggling on the other side. First of all, you want to make sure it's your house. That's the first thing. <laughs> Second thing, you should... It's very embarrassing to shoot very, very somebody embarrassing else. to shoot a neighbour. Now, <laughs> you should remember before you beat the door down that it's your door. That's the other thing you should remember. And make sure you put the lights on first. Otherwise, you could be shooting the wrong person. And if you beat the door down, you're going to pay the bill for putting the door up again anyway. That's it. The other thing that bothers me, I think, and Canadians don't think enough about it, is death. You know? It's how to behave when a doctor tells you you haven't got long to go. Right? They should look at it from the doctor's point of view. This guy, this is a fact, he has spent 25 years at medical school. That's how long they do now. Then they get this diploma, see? Now he's been told he can cure everything, right? Here he is, he's met something he can't do anything about. So he's very unhappy about it. The second thing, and more important, is about to lose a paying customer. Why are you about to leave him? <laughs> so you shouldn't get upset and start beating him around the head. Otherwise, you might be delighted that you're ready to go. <laughs> the other thing about death while we're on the subject is that I'm appalled that Canadians are not preparing for it. Mind you, we, in our class, we know where we're going. Like, you wouldn't be sure, <laughs> so we're not bothered. But the fact is uh, that they are not prepared with last words, for instance. See? They figure, I'll tell a joke when I'm ready to go. That's hopeless. All the room starts laughing. They could be laughing because you're going. <laughs> you're never sure, see? So what you should do, I, I looked up a couple of last words that I liked. One was Oscar Wilde, who you know, died in poverty, died in this incredible crummy room with this appalling wallpaper. And it said, he looked at the wallpaper and said, one of us has to go. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was a billionaire who died. True story, this. And of course, the room was packed with relatives, right? And he went like this to the nearest relative, so this guy came forward with his grubby little hands, see? He bent his ear down, all excited, to the old man's mouth, and the old man said, Boo! <laughs> <laughs> so be ready with your last words. Have you got your own last words prepared? I've got my own last words, but I don't want to tell anyone. They'll all be copying them. <laughs> what kind of deal is that when you've People heard People who are dying in droves and quoting Ben Wicks. <laughs> That's it, yeah, without credit. That's, That's what annoys me. You're doing well in the books. Yeah, this is, a, this is now pre-orders of 15,000. It's gone into his second printing. Is that bestseller? Well, I'm told a bestseller in Canada is 5,000. But they don't read in Canada. So how the hell can you tell? <laughs> well, this will sell in Britain and the States. Oh, this will sell because it's, it's, it's little words and lots of pictures. Except for Canadians it's, like that. There's a lot of Cockney <laughs> slang in it. Lots of Cockney slang. There's a, there's a dictionary at the back for people who don't understand. And also, I was at a dinner a couple of months ago where the guy thanked me, right, for speaking. And he stood up and he said, I love that speech. He said, surely here is living proof that it's possible to succeed in this great country of ours, well, even if you no, can't speak in even with official, official languages. Language. <laughs> that, of course, has been told to death about Eugene Whelan, Jack Webster. No, it was told about me first. And then you came in on the act, Benny Wicks. <laughs> that was great. And I did do another drawing. Yeah, but did you enjoy the book? Yeah, That's I what enjoyed I want it to know. very much. Indeed. You loved it. Can you, do a, a ca can you do a cartoon of me? No, you don't do cartoons. Well, I can, but it all look, always looks like Trudeau. Everyone I draw Every, looks uh, Okay, draw Trudeau. Right, That's it's it. Draw, right, Trudeau. draw Trudeau. You're interviewing him, mate. You're talking to him next Tuesday week. Morning. Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning? Would you morning. give him my best? No, I won't. <laughs> 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 what are you going to ask him? I'd be interested. Would you give me half a dozen questions for him? Yeah, I would. Ask him when the fleet now he's going to leave. <laughs> That's a good one for start <laughs> I'm sure anxious to know that. It really is. is. I asked him that the last time. Oh, did you? What did mm. he say? He said, when you retire, I'll retire. So what about it? I didn't get up and walk away. I, <laughs> I muffed my line and my opportunity. What else? Let me see that. Oh, you didn't see it? Oh, yeah. What now, if you... I sign that, that's worth a lot of money. Well, sign it. No, I'm not. Are no, you no. kidding? No, I, no, I can't sign it. Sign it. How much is it worth? I, I go in a restaurant now and I give them pictures <laughs> when I've had a good meal. So what would you like for Christmas? What would I like for Christmas? This is your outcast this morning. Oh, is he? Yeah. I haven't read it. Did so you what would you it? like for Christmas? Oh, a nuclear war. Yeah, nuclear I, war. I did it a month ago. It's yeah. a month in, a, in advance. A month in advance. Now, isn't that interesting that this is the big issue today? Today. Well, with Regan's uh, big 
big stuff. You hit it, you hit it right on the head. I did. I always do. <laughs> okay. no, I enjoy, I'm not going to go to the funds. I'm going to take some, another joke from it. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, it's not a joke, actually. It may be some, someone you know, and I think it is interesting to know this. Did you ever know a Pamela Bailey? She, w um, she was a reporter on the Toronto Telegram. No. This is a true story. She would never, ever buy a lottery ticket or a hockey ticket, none of that, see? Now, she went to the Montreal Gazette, and I heard a month ago, and this is fate, bloody peculiar. She was walking out the Montreal Gazette on a street, and a guy stopped her with these $10 lottery tickets for a million dollars, see? Right, now I'm told she figured, geez, I really should buy one of these, right? She gives him the 10 bucks, he gets, this is true, I don't want you laughing. She gets out, he gets out the tickets, she's about to take the top ticket, and a breeze blows down the street, and it blows the top two over. And she took the next one down, and she still didn't win. <laughs> I knew that was a punchline, one of the oldest stories. You've got to be, you always knock these down, these stories. Yeah, I know. I still can't get over my favourite story of you, but you haven't got time to tell it now. No, we haven't got the, you always tell it, that one. About the Undertaker. Yeah, and the under, father, Elf Smith. Your father going up to the pub with this family tragedy, the Undertaker saying, I can do a cheap job for you for five dollars. Yeah. That was my twin brother. Fifteen brother. He put between a, a, a blonde woman's legs. As I said in the book, I figure it's a bloody good way to go. <laughs> ben, you're incorrigible. Ben Wicks, etiquette, believe it or not, after the break. <laughs> Just about a year ago, I interviewed a prisoner in our penitentiary system by the name of John Clifford. 